May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today I thought I'd start with a poem. There once was a pious young priest who lived almost wholly on yeast. For, he said, it is plain, we must all rise again. And I want to get started, at least. <laughs> Today's reading, Gospel reading, is very much about food. And where to find food, and what do we do if we have no food? And anyone who's been looking for yeast recently in supermarkets will realise that that's one of the hardest things on the planet to find at the moment. I found some recently in a supermarket. I had to look twice, three times, to make sure it was in fact yeast and I wasn't imagining it. Where do we get food? Where do we look for food? That's been one of the most pressing questions for the whole of humankind ever since, well, I don't know how long ago. It's one of our primary needs as human beings. We need food. We need shelter. We also need companionship. But where do we get food? Once you reach a certain age in your growing up, you realise that food doesn't magically appear in the fridge. And once you reach another age, you realise that food doesn't magically appear in the shops either. There is something called the supply chain. And we are being grateful for all those during the pandemic who have maintained that supply chain. Sometimes in the face of panic buying and all the rest of it. But obviously we get food in a shop, don't we? Well, we do in this culture, usually. Although, again, encouragingly, more people have been growing their own. We've been presented at the vicarage with some lovely lettuces and all sorts of things recently. Because people have been trying to be a bit more self-sufficient, and that's brilliant. Of course, if you haven't got a shop handy, you have to uh, bone up on what Bear Grylls does and all that sort of stuff, and recognise what berries you can and can't eat, and go foraging and perhaps uh, kill wild, I don't know. But, you know, this hunt for food is something that drives mankind at a very d deep level, an almost visceral level. Some people are addicted to food, but we all know the feeling of being satisfied by good food, just the right amount, at just the right time. And the question is, of course, from our Gospel reading, where do you find food in a desert? Jesus hears of the death of John the Baptist, who is his cousin, and I think it affected him deeply. We don't have any pictures that I can think of, representations of Jesus rowing a boat, but that's what he did. He left in a boat to be by himself. Who wouldn't when they just had shattering news? And not only the fact that his cousin had died, but also that he knew in his heart that he would be looked for next, and indeed he was. It brought his crucifixion, his passion, all the more close. But he went to a deserted place. The trouble was it didn't work out that way and all the crowds wanted to be with him and follow. So we have this situation of thousands of people, much more than 5,000 because that was just the number of males. We had women and children as well. It could have been up to 10,000. And where did they get food from? But here's the question. Where do you look for spiritual food? In consumerist culture, we're so used to looking for food, food, in a shop, that some people tend to look for spiritual food in a shop as well. I went to Glastonbury once, uh, playing music, and uh, I, looking around the town, I couldn't believe how many shops there were selling things to help people with being spiritual. Everything from crystals to pictures to dream catchers to, well, goodness knows what. Is that the way we get spiritual food? How we meet our spiritual hunger? How we meet our spiritual thirst? Our first reading talked about thirsting for the right food rather than the wrong food. Well, you might find something that's helpful. It's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? How do we satisfy our spiritual longing, our spiritual craving? 
Do we look for the answer in creation? Well, it can be a very spiritual thing, creation, and many people around here are very thankful that we live in such a beautiful place, so inspirational. Do we look for it in the creative arts? Well, that could be a help too. Art is essentially, I believe, a spiritual thing, whether it's music or dance or the visual arts or whatever. We can find something deep that goes deeper than just blobs of paint or vibrations coming from a string or a brass instrument. Do we find spirituality in community? Again, that is a possibility, which is why we gather here in church. Do we find it in wise people? We find it in all sorts of unexpected places. And that's the thing, spiritual food is a bit difficult to pin down. You go looking with much less certainty, perhaps, than you look for food. But that brings us back to the Gospel reading. The people there were gathered to hear Jesus, and they hadn't perhaps given thought to a long trip out, they just wanted to be with this guy who actually promised them this spiritual food, who, were meet, who was meeting this need. It was unexpected, but they'd found something very precious and they didn't want to let it go, so they wanted to follow him wherever he went. But then they had a real hunger, and Jesus miraculously satisfied. And never mind the miracle, I'm not going to go into the details of how that may or may not have happened because I am not, frankly, a clue. But the whole event remembers, remembers the feeding of the Israelites in the desert, the manna from heaven, providing bread when people were hungry. The whole thing recollects, although they're much more obscure, passages where the prophets in the Old Testament miraculously feed. And the whole thing pre-configures, pre, I can't remember the word now, but it looks forward, that's the right word, to the crucifixion. It looks forward specifically to the Last Supper, where the same order, almost the same words are used of Jesus take, taking bread and blessing and breaking and giving. It brings this event that is in the future completely unknown to those around Jesus, into the present. And it says something very profound and very important still to this day. This bloke, Jesus Christ, he offered spiritual food, which wasn't junk spiritual food, which is the sort of fare that had been offered by the religious leaders of Israel both then and back in the Old Testament, where the prophets were speaking out against it. Not a fake thing, but a real thing. And he offered meat and drink of a spiritual kind that left people satisfied. The, Russian, the translation we read today said all ate and were filled. It would be better to say that they all ate and were satisfied. It's a deep sense of satisfaction inside. And so, this idea of eating spiritually comes to the centre of what we do as Christians. Which is why we have a Eucharist, a Holy Communion. You won't go away physically satisfied by eating a, a little wafer of bread today. But my prayer is, and I think our, all of our prayers are, that we go away spiritually satisfied from having met with God. This person who can actually fill all our spiritual needs and say things to us in our innermost being that, well, we can't give expression to. We come here to spiritual feast. And the Eucharist, of course, harks back to all those events in the Old Testament and this event itself, but specifically to the Last Supper. But it also looks forward, just like the feeding of the 5,000, to a future event. It looks forward to a heavenly banquet. Countless times the Bible talks about this feasting in heaven. 
where we will be satisfied all the time with real and satisfying food, the food of love, the food of God himself. So as we meet and we celebrate communion, we invite God to fill us so that we are satisfied. And because the source of that satisfaction is Christ's self-giving, we take inspiration from his example. We take inspiration from his lead and his sacrifice. And we give ourselves to the glory of God and so that he might nourish others through us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um.